see a full room uh, here in Bangor. Uh, we've been very excited to, to come to Bangor to talk to you about a better deal for Maine. Um, Uh, so it is great to be here with uh, uh, Senate Democratic Leader Justin Alphon. We are here to talk about our Better Deal for May plan. Uh, we're also here very much to listen to you, to get feedback, to hear from you as a community about uh, what your ideas, what your vision is on growing Maine's economy and making sure that we're doing right uh, by Mainers. So before we get started, I just wanted to say a couple thank you. Thank you. Uh, first of all, Reverend Mark Doty. Connie and Paul for helping with logistics this evening uh, here at the Hammond Street Congregational Church. A round of applause for those folks. Who have been here. I do have to say, uh, as a nonpartisan institution, they are not necessarily endorsing the Better Deal for Maine plan, but our hope is by the end of the evening they will. So. <laughs> Again, it's really exciting to be here in, in Bangor. We had a, a number of uh, cities, as you can imagine, to choose from to kick off our first public forum to talk about the, the better deal for Maine. We chose Bangor for a couple of different reasons, several different reasons. Uh, first of all, we're going to talk about it a little bit uh, this evening. Uh, our better deal for Maine plan has a lot to offer to Bangor, and the governor's proposed budget, Bangor has a lot to lose. Uh, Five million dollars in revenue sharing, education funding. Uh, we want to make sure that we're having a public conversation here in Bangor. We also wanted to come. I wanted to come and say how uh, how we admire uh, Bangor for what you guys have done over the last decade. A real renaissance has happened here in Bangor. And And you are a great example for the rest of the state. You have invested in your community. There is a great return on that. We want to make sure that you don't lose any ground in the governor's budget. It goes the wrong way. We want to make sure that you can continue to make those investments right here in Bangor and the surrounding area. So it is thrilling to be here uh, this evening. Before we get into the meat of the, uh, of the presentation, uh, I wanted to recognize um, your area, the, the local legislators, the delegation here. And I don't have to tell you guys what an amazing delegation you have. And I hope you know that. I hope you thank them for your service. And I want to make sure that you know who they are. And I'm going to take a little bit of time to call them out individually, just so that you can put a face to the name if you don't know them, to hound them, harass them, and uh, do what you need to do to make sure that your voice is heard with your elected official. Senator Bradwick in the back. Good, who's the chair of the taxation committee? Yeah. Uh, Troy Cornfield, who's the chair of our education committee? Yeah. Senator Jim Dill, who serves on the Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry committee. coming in the room who serves on the uh, Appropriations Committee. <laughs> Ryan Tipping Spitz from Orno who serves on the Education Committee. <laughs> we have John Schneck here from Bangor. Hey, hey. <laughs> and we have Archie Barrow behind the post serving on the Transportation Committee. to thank the local uh, elected officials. If you serve on the town council or school committee, whether it's here in Bangor or in the surrounding communities, if you could stand up and just let us know who you are. I wanted to make sure that I can personally thank you. I do know that there are a couple council meetings going on this evening. Um, I'm getting some head nods. So I just want to make sure that we are recognizing folks that, that were in the room. A little bit about myself. Uh, I'm uh, Mark Yates, Speaker of the Main House. I have the privilege of serving. Uh, the, the towns of North Burke and South Burke. I live in North Burke. It's a small community in York County. I live there with my wife. Uh, we've been married about 15 years. Uh, she, uh, we have three kids together. Um, our oldest is uh, Elena. She's 10 years old. She's in the fourth grade. Uh, our middle is Lucas. He is in the second grade. He's eight years old. And our youngest is Naomi. She is five years old. 
and she is in kindergarten. We are extremely concerned about the governor's proposal as parents to make sure that we're doing right by our schools. I get inspired every morning and every evening when I see them, as I leave and as I come. Uh, we also have uh, two pigs, seven chickens, a fish, a cat, and we're gonna get two goats in, in, in a couple weeks. So we are a full household. Um, I grew up in a large family. I'm the youngest of seven siblings. My mother was a teacher. My father was a chaplain in the United States Air Force. Um, they taught us uh, when you pull together, when you work together, that we all do better. Yeah. yeah. Those, those are the values that I see across Maine in every community. Those are the values that we came to the table with to develop a plan that represents Maine values. And Maine is at a crossroads. Our economy is lagging behind the nation and our region. The tax system is rigged for those at the top. The governor has proposed a budget that makes it worse. And Democrats have a different vision, a better deal for Maine. And our better deal for Maine invests in middle class economics. We believe that you grow the economy from the middle out, not the top down. And that's what our plan really does. We will go through detail about our plan and really provide an opportunity to make sure that you have a time to ask your questions. Senator Alphon is going to run through the, the detail, the meat of the plan. I will finish it up, and then we will um, circulate around the room, making sure that you have an opportunity to, to ask your questions. Uh, we do have a different vision for Maine. We believe in middle class economics. When you put more money in the pockets of middle class working families, they're going to spend it, the, the businesses are going to do better, these individuals are going to do better, and we're all going to do better. And that's part of the big debate that we're having in this state. The governor has put forward a plan that, that, that believes in the theory, the failed theory of trickle-down economics. We believe in middle-class economics, and we'd love to have a public conversation with you guys this evening. So with no further ado, um, Justin Alphon. always great to be back in Central Maine. Uh, as some of you know, I grew up just uh, 45 minutes uh, west of here in Dexter. Uh, it was formative years for me, and Dexter, Maine, uh, really made me who I am as an adult. Because in Dexter, just like many communities around Bangor, you always are pulling together, whether it's athletics, or whether it's academics, whatever it is, you know it's a small town, you are working together all the time. I am proud to be the Senate Democratic leader. Uh, in the Senate, we have an amazing group of senators, uh, Senator Gratwick and Bill, uh, being here tonight. But we've got an amazing group of folks that every day are working hard for you. When we thought about putting together a better deal, we thought about some fundamental values. And the speaker uh, talked about a lot of those. But one of them he did mention, which is the idea that we have to look at how we as progressives start moving our state. And we as progressives, you know, for a long time, at least since, you know, the last five years, have had a smaller voice. We have had a smaller voice. And you know what? It's time for those values, for those beliefs to be put into a plan. And that's what we did with the Better Deal. And so I'm gonna run through uh, a bunch of it tonight. Uh, and then I really, and I know the speaker is very excited to answer questions because we believe this is a very strong counter proposal to the governor's failed trickle-down economics, and we are excited to hear the debate, we're excited to be part of the debate, and so while we get started. So, you know, uh, you know I'm not gonna read this, but look, I mean, look, we've, we've talked about this a lot. We want the middle class to do better, and we're gonna get to how we do it in our plan. So who really benefits? So, the better deal. Look, the better deal is built around uh, a contrast, a very big contrast to trickle-down economics. The governor has put his plan out there. And this, this, this is a fascinating slide because under the governor's plan, 50% of his income taxes go to the top 10%. If anyone thinks that this is a way to grow our economy, then I, I'm looking forward to hearing how that is going to happen because what we're talking about is middle class economics where 98% of the income tax relief goes to the bottom 95%. How do we do this? We make sure that the people at the top pay their fair share. We make sure that corporations pay their fair share. We make sure that non-residents get 
as much of those taxes that we can pass on to them. So we're going to talk more about that tonight. So it's very clear how we're paying for it. So this is a better deal for young families and seniors. So one of the, one of the pillars of our plan is that we know when we talk to Maine families, Maine homeowners, that property taxes are tough. They're hard, they're tough, and they're going up. With the governor's plan, he says, you know what? We are, we are going to get rid of revenue sharing. We're going to eliminate that. We are, we are what we're going to do with Homestead, and I know this is a great crowd tonight, but for Homestead, he says, I'm only going to do it for those over 65. Well, and what he does is he raises it to $20,000. Well, that's a fine idea, but he's missing a lot of Maine, all of those under 65. So what we do here for the better deal is we say we're going to pump $60 million into Homestead exemption. Every single homeowner across the state is going to have $20,000 that is exempt. The next piece of it is that we are going to adopt the governor's property tax fairness credit. So this is how you get $120 million of property tax relief going to every single main homeowner. A better deal for students and workers. So the governor in his plan says, you know, we're going to put some money into education. He puts $15 million a year into education. We know, and, and Representative Cornfield could tell you, that is not keeping up with our mill rates. That's not keeping up with the cost of education. What the better deal does here is says we're going to increase that by $20 million each year. So it's going to be a, a net plus of $35 million, $70 million over the biennium going to help K through 12. And we know that you know, if we're going to grow our economy, if we're going to move forward, we need to be putting more money into education. Next. So a better deal for Maine community. So right now, uh, the governor, and I call it kind of his uh, greatest hits, he, for whatever reason, forgets his time as mayor of Waterville. And mayor of Waterville, he complained, you know, he complained every time that Governor Baldacci even thought about touching revenue sharing. Well, now as governor, he's kind of put on a different hat, and you know he's decided in this budget for the first year of the budget he's going to keep revenue sharing flat at 62 million, and then he's going to completely eliminate it. He then had some sort of idea that we're just going to tax nonprofits to make up for that loss in funding. Well, I think we've all learned that that's just first of all a bad idea. And secondly, and that's not just Democrats saying that, that's the Republicans on the Taxation Committee completely rejecting that idea. So we have rejected the nonprofit tax. But in addition, we said, as Democrats, how do we make sure that we have strong communities? Strong communities for police, fire, roads, all of the public safety that we know are important to Maine families. And so we moved this revenue sharing from $62 million to $80 million per year, which we think is going to help with all of us as far as our property tax. So uh, the better deal also uh, subscribes to uh, something that I think we all have to subscribe to every single day. We have to pay for the things that we want. <laughs> Unfortunately, the governor has a habit of putting out these big tax cuts and not paying for them, and then we all have to pay for them in the future. What we decided is no, this, our value is that we have to pay for what we're planning. So in this, in this biennial budget, which would start on July 1st, we have fully paid for our plan. Now, take that into contrast to the governor, where he um, is putting out a four-year plan. And first of all, as many of you know in this room, you know, to, to buy the next legislature, into anything, it's pretty impossible. But he's trying to do it, and uh, for that wonderful promise, he's going to leave us a $300 million hole in our 1819 biennial budget. Now, how is he going to pay for it? Well, just recently in a, one of his uh, interviews, he said, you know what, there's at least $250 million that we can take out of education. Well, I mean, so, you know, I just, I just told you all that we want to put $70 million into education in this budget, and that would go forward. What he's saying is that we're going to take $250 million out. And I just, it's hard for me to understand, you know, where else he's going to go for the money, but he's at least telegraphing that education is going to take a big hit in the next budget. It's not just the responsible, it's not something that we can, that we can support. So let's just, uh, the facts and the numbers. So this is just in summary. We have $120 million going back 
into direct property tax relief. Again, that's the homestead exemption, and that is the property tax fairness credit. We have $80 million a year, and this is per year. We have $80 million per year going back for revenue sharing. That's going to support police, fire, public works, public safety. And then $20 million going back to per year for K-12. And again, this is paid for. We have paid for it. And how do we pay for it? Some of you might be saying, well, how does this all happen? When you don't have a tax package that gives the top 10%, 50% of all of the income taxes, you have a lot of money to work with. How much money? It's about $300 million that we are, that we are saying, you know what? We're going to invest that differently. How are we investing it? We're showing you how we're investing it. We're investing it in these places, 120 into property taxes, 80 into revenue sharing, 20 million into K through 12. So let's talk about just a little bit about the income tax relief. Again, the governor, top 10%, get 50% of all the income tax cuts that he is proposing. We said, you know, let's take a smaller amount of income tax cuts and really target them. Let's make sure that 98% of the income taxes that we put in this budget go to 95% of all income tax payers. I mean, this is going to put more money into every decile, all the way up, all the way up to 95%, all the way up to 95%, we will, under our plan, under the Better Deal plan, be able to provide more income tax relief than the governor. It's about an average of $191 uh, for a middle class family. And again, we are targeting middle and low income families, and we're asking the wealthy to pay their fair share. We're asking the corporations to pay their fair share. that come to our state and we're asking them to pay their fair share also. So again, under the property tax fairness credit, we will be bumping this up. I mean, many of you in this room know that right now $600 and $900 is the most you can get out of the property tax fairness credit. We are going to bump that up to $1,000 and $1,500 depending on age and eligibility. And then also thinking about pro property taxes on average, $300. So let's just talk about here in, this, in the city of Bangor. Your mill rate is just over 20 mills per thousand. That means, that means that each one of you that owns a home in the Bangor area would be getting on average a $400 tax cut in your property taxes under our plan. <laughs> so again, I, I really look forward to uh, the questions. I'm going to pass it over to the speaker uh, who is going to lead through uh, uh, the final slides and then on to Q&A. Thanks, Sarah Alphon. So really, how does our plan stack up? A lot of people have asked that question. Um, it's really about middle class economics versus triple down economics. I mean, it comes down to that. How do you believe the economy grows? We believe it grows when you put more money in the pockets of working class uh, family uh, hands so that they can go out on Main Street, spend it, get it into the economy. Those folks do better. We all do better. So we prioritize a tax cut for the middle class. We just said that that's where the, that's where the tax relief should go. So as uh, Senator Alphonse said, that's represented in the chart over here around who benefits. Uh, property tax relief. We have all knocked on doors with elected officials, and many of you have probably spoken to us about the high burden of property taxes. Uh, we thought that we have an opportunity to do something about that, and we're investing in that in a big way. Increased revenue sharing. I talked about Bangor losing $5 million in the governor's budget. Not only do we keep current funding levels for revenue sharing, we bump it up some because we know how important it is. I was getting out of my car as I drove up here. An ambulance was racing by. And you think about where that ambulance is going and where it wouldn't be going if we weren't able to adequately fund our fire, our police, and all the public works that, that revenue sharing helps support. Uh, and we feel it's a, it's a promise that we have uh, kept with our communities and we need to continue to, to keep that commitment. Uh, another thing that hasn't been mentioned, the governor raises the sales tax to 6.5%. We keep it at its current rate of 5.5%. Uh, and we feel like those that, that really helps middle and low income families by, by holding that sales tax at the rate that it currently is. So who benefits? Um, over here, there's a poster. Many of you probably can't see it. Uh, three different examples about uh, who would benefit under our plan. So the Better Deal for Maine plan. This is a, a, a married couple, two kids. Uh, I know that most people don't, as a family, don't make $100,000 a year, but it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an example we wanted to use. Under this plan, 
we have a total tax reduction of $600. This beats the governor's plan by $400. So we are able to put into this family's pocket $400 more than the governor's plan and $600 total. The next example, I believe, is a retired couple over 65 years of age. They've got an annual investment income of about $10,000 and a combined social security of $30,000. So $40,000 combined income between the two of them. Under our plan, you can see roughly about a $200 tax reduction. This beats the governor's plan by $250. So we do that in a combination of ways, property tax, sales tax, income tax. The third example is a single mom with one kid earning about $30,000 a year. In our plan, the total tax reduction would be about $177, and again, it beats the little page plan by $183. So these are three examples about who would benefit. And we feel, again, that if you put more money into the pockets of working class manners, they're going to spend it. If we give a huge tax cut, whether it's the 50% or the top 10%, or the individual, the top 1%, somebody making $400,000 a year, getting a tax cut under the governor's plan of $10,000, I know where that money's gonna go. It's not gonna go back into your economy. It's gonna go into a retirement account or another vacation. I know if I ask a question, I won't go around the room, but my guess is every single person in this room, you would know what to do with $200 to $600. If that money was given to you, you would know, how to, you, you would know where that would go in the next 30 to 60 days. I know I would spend it. I know exactly how I'd spend it. And I know that you know how you would spend it, and that's how we grow our economy, making sure that we give people an opportunity, we give them a break, and they invest in our economy. Again, those businesses do better, those families do better, we all do better. So we are rejecting the trickle-down economics that have failed this state, that has failed our country. We are putting our stock and our faith in the middle class. We believe that you grow the economy from the middle out. Again, our state is at a crossroads. Our economy is lagging behind. The tax system is rigged for those at the top. The governor has put forward a budget to make it worse. Our plan, the Better Deal for Maine, makes it better. Those are the top lines and the highlights, and we really wanted to open it up to questions at this point. Uh, Jody Kofair from my office will be circulating around the room uh, to make sure that we can get to everybody. Uh, we have no particular order or any way uh, to do this. I think just with a, a hand raised, uh, we'll, we'll take our first question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for uh, bringing this plan to Bangor. My name is John York. Uh, I live in the city of Bangor, but I also represent the uh, professional firefighters of the city of Bangor as well. We have, uh, we have approximately uh, 88 men and women that serve the city proudly every day. One of the things that Governor LePage's plan has done over the years, as you've already reiterated, is We've cut revenue sharing to the point where we've had to go and once again ask the federal government for help to fund our positions for the City of Bangor Fire Department. With your plan, do you see that decreasing at all? Or is that going to stay at the 80 million? Or do you think that will start to increase again back to where it needs to be, where it was even six years ago, for instance? So that's a great question. Uh, really about what we're going to do to continue to do to invest in communities like Bangor, where we're going to continue to to keep our commitment. So currently, um, uh, the governor has uh, put forward in his budget to zero out revenue sharing. So I think you guys were having a conversation uh, over the last couple of years about whether you could continue to fund the library. I think I remember reading about that. Um, these are decisions that you will have to make as a city if Governor Page's budget moves forward. You will have to make decisions about what is the police force, what is the firefighter department going to look like under a budget that um, doesn't account for any revenue sharing. So we make sure that we put $80 million that is more than what is currently funding. So as towns and cities are developing those budgets, I went to my uh, town hall meeting last week, uh, finalizing the budget. Um, towns need to have some assurances around what we're gonna have in our plan. You would get current funding plus, plus some. So I don't wanna get too technical, too weedy. 2% is what it's currently funded at. We're funding it at 2.5%, and we're making sure that we're making strong investments in our, in our fire, in our police, in our public works, because we know the value of that. 
It's worked here in Bangor. You guys are a, a great example of, uh, of what happens when you make investments in the community. Thank you. I would like some more details. You, where is the money going to come from? You mentioned the upper uh, echelon earners or uh, uh, people paying their fair share. You also mentioned something about tourism or people from away. But I would like some more specifics on that. So, great question. Um, under the Better Deal, uh, what we do is first, the governor has created a framework, and there are some parts of that framework that we've adopted. We've talked about the property tax fairness credit being one of them. So we look at all of his moving parts, and we recognize very quickly, just like you in this room recognize, that 50% of his income tax cuts, $300 million or so, are going to the top 10%. So when you take that away, you can start investing. What we do is we uh, look at the expansion of the sales base. So we've adopted the governor's sales base expansion. There's around 200 plus new sales taxes that we believe, uh, and the governor believes, and the Republicans on taxation believe, and the main heritage policy believes. I think the state now <laughs> believes that we have a sales tax structure that is much too narrow. And we all are joining hands. This is, uh, I look at Senator Perry. I look at Senator Perry, who was part of that 2009 plan that did expand the sales base, but we did it alone. This time, we're not doing it alone. The governor has said, look, let's expand the sales base. There's 30 million people that are coming into our state. Let's push as much of those taxes to non-residents. So that is one way that, we're, that we are increasing a lot of money that we can put forth in the investments in revenue sharing, put the investments in K-12. That, in addition to not putting $300 million towards the top 10%, that gives us the money that we need to invest in the programs that we've talked about uh, tonight. We have another question. Yes. We got Jody over here, circulating the room. Hello, I'm Ann Marston. I live in Bangor. I'd like to tell you, first of all, I'm very squarely on your team. However, I want to give you some feedback about why I think and how I think you are losing in getting out the message uh, in opposition to the Governor LePage. He keeps his message to two or three words. Sadly, liberal equals welfare equals bad. And he pounds it over and over again. <coughs> We need, as Democrats, to simplify our message and get it out much more effectively. This man is doing things that I think is dark, are, they're incompetent and criminal, and I feel that my legislators are not speaking loudly uh, about this. Not nearly loudly enough. Uh, <laughs> you know that I listened to, I'm sorry, I can't uh, tell you exactly what program on public radio this week, were you on it? That was me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was you. Well, anyway, uh, so Andre Cushing is putting out these ridiculous arguments about things like uh, that the, this whole economic plan is working in other states. And you cited states that it weren't, Louisiana, I think, and Kentucky, where it was a disaster. And he's like, okay, but New Hampshire. Well, hello. There, there are no real comparisons here. That's kind of crazy. Anyway, also, I am an English, former English and French teacher. I know nothing about economics. I can't balance my checkbook. But I do know that sales tax is regressive. It hurts the low and middle people. I'm afraid I disagree with you about broadening it. I don't want that to happen. I'd like it to go back to five. I think income tax is much more fair. And by the way, I'm getting killed in property tax and this little rebate's not going to help me a bit. I have a house in Kingfield. Last year, my property taxes went up 25% expressly due to loss of revenue sharing. 25% in one year. It's not going down. I'm sorry, if I'm getting on, I, yeah, really, no, I think that's right. small I think. business, he used the example small business versus 
salaried workers? Ridiculous. A small business owner controls his own income. If he thinks he's paying too much income tax this year, he lowers his income. He has all kinds of uh, deductions that a, that a salary earner does not have. I want you guys to speak louder, to speak more simply, to speak more clearly, and to be relentless. Thank you. Team. <laughs> <laughs> on, on the program, and <clears throat> I'll give you three simple things: middle class tax cut, lower property taxes, education. That is what our plan is, and that is why we felt compelled to come out with a plan. Not just to say that we think the governor has a terrible idea, but an opportunity to really stand on what our values are, what we think. We should be investing in middle class tax cut, property tax relief, education. Those are the things that are going to grow our economy. Those are the things that are going to help you out with your property taxes. If we adopt the governor's budget, your taxes will continue to skyrocket. Okay, I'm just going to interject one quick thing. Yep. <laughs> Can't build a village this big, 22 abandoned houses. That's real. Yep. And that, that's no jobs. Jobs are really important. Yep, they are. And, and I don't want to get too far flung from our conversation around the tax proposal, but we uh, have been going all around the state on the jobs tour, making sure that we're talking to small businesses, making sure that we're investing in the right way. And every single time we go and we talk to a company, the number one thing, it's not tax cuts, it's workforce. It's invest in our workforce. Make sure that we have the training and the trained skilled workers uh, for, for our jobs, because we have an aging demographic in our state. We have retiring workers. We were up in Aroostook County talking to the loggers about what they needed. We were down in Southern Maine talking to, to the machinists, talking about how they need to have jobs. So we need to make sure that we're developing public-private partnerships with uh, local small businesses. Uh, we've been all over. We're doing that. And we feel like that is the strategy to help grow our economy as well. Um, but I, I really pre appreciate your passion and your feedback. Uh, the next time I see Andre Cushing, I will uh, scold him for you. Uh, <laughs> and I look forward uh, to doing that. Thank you for the feedback. <laughs> Hi, my name is Matt. I live here in Bangor. Um, one, of the, one of the growing communities in Maine are small farmers. Um, we have a huge, one of the largest percents of small farmers in, in all the nation. How does your budget um, help small farmers? Um, that's, it seems that the governor or the more uh, right-leaning uh, thinkers tend to side with big farms and, and big, um, you know, larger industrial farms, but main farmers, the small farmers need help, and does your budget address that? Well, it certainly does in a couple of ways. Property tax relief, and if you make $150,000 a year as an individual, or $300,000 as a family, you'll get a tax cut. More money in your pocket, I'm hoping will help you help you uh, with your business, and uh, that be replicated all over the state. So, Justin, if you want to, uh, I, 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 great question, and I think the speaker handed it perfect. And I live in Herman, but I've taught in Bangor for 26 years. And uh, you began to speak a little bit about um, education, and we know with the governor's plan, you know, the Bangor School Department's going to take a huge hit um, with his plan. And you began to talk about how it might affect Bangor at the beginning of your speech, but could you give us a little bit more specific details as to how your plan could help um, the school department? I can, and thanks for the question. So uh, for some of you that know, uh, when I entered into the State Senate, I was uh, glad to be in the majority, and uh, Libby Mitchell was my Senate President. I was serving with Senator Perry over there, and I was the Chair of the Education Committee, and it was one of the thrills of my life, and I kept serving for two more years in the Education Committee. We all know that education is critical. It is key to our economic future. We get it, you get it. Bangor is a shining example of a great public school system. I mean, an incredible public school system. I'm not just saying that to represent a corner. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, so, uh, under the governor's uh, plan, he does put $15 million a year towards public education. 
But if you also notice is that during the budget discussions happening here in Bangor and across the state, the mill rate right now for, for uh, schools is about 8.11. It's going to go up to 8.41. What that is going to do is going to drive everyone's property taxes up higher, and he's not keeping up with the cost of education. We're not getting any closer to 55%. Under our plan, we put $40 million more million into uh, the pot going into K-12, $20 million each year. So for the city of Bangor, that would mean a, an extra $428,000 per year going to the Bangor schools. I know not everyone here is from Bangor. So let's talk about Brewer. In Brewer, uh, we would um, put uh, $125,000 more into the Brewer schools every single year. And then Orono, uh, under our plan, again, putting $20 million per year into K-12, through it'd be $69,000. So this is real money, this is probably going to save a teacher, this is probably going to save a program, this is probably going to make the investments that you all need to be successful with the students you know, for today and tomorrow, and it's something that we are proud to do. Uh, I know Representative Cornfield and others are saying, put more, put more, and we're going to try. We're going to try, absolutely, but it's a, it's a good start. Again, and this is coming off the heels of the last budget where Democrats insisted an extra $32 million went into GPA. So if you take the cumulative uh, effect of what the Democrats and the governor is doing, you're talking about $102 million going into GPA, general purpose aid, for K-12 over the past uh, three and a half years. So it's, it's a good start. I know we, we, can, we must continue to support our K-12 and our higher ed. Let's not forget our higher ed in this equation. It's not enough just to make sure we have great K-12 schools. We've got to make sure our university main system, our, our, our community colleges, are funded at the appropriate levels too so that Maine students, when they graduate from our high schools, have the best choices they can make here in the state of Maine. Hi, I'm Deb White. I live and work in Orono, Maine. And continuing with the education and segue into uh, lower and middle income class families, um, as a teacher at the ACC Adams School in Orono, I frequently have many student teachers that I mentor. Many of them want to stay in this area and start their careers and raise their families. How will the Better Deal for Maine help them? So when you think about what the speaker said, the three things.